Next up, we have uh, Tristan White, and he's going to be talking about incorporating technology in vocational education. Stick around, this one is going to be fun. Enjoy. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, my name is Tristan. I work for a company called Fosh, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we do we, through incorporating technology in the vocational education, the, the topic. Um, I'm a BIM specialist for Fosh. I also work with the product development, and I'm going to go through a little bit of the technologies we use and how we use them to achieve what we would like to achieve. Okay, so we are, our company, we specialize in the development of learning content, uh, training material and learning experiences for various trades, including plumbing, electrical, bricklaying, so throughout Africa as well as South Africa. Um, and what I want to talk about next is first the foundation, start laying the foundation of how we develop on top of the platform. So I come from an architectural background and there were a few tools that we used we used in the industry that then I saw that we could implement and use um, to educate artisans a bit better and show them a little bit more of a contextualized learning environment. So firstly, I'll talk a little bit about BIM. So like I said, a lot of the advantages of these, these models, so BIM is a 3D environment where we can program information into these 3D models and then use that to give that information over to students. But I'll start small and then build on top of that and kind of show what I mean by that. So for example, this is a circuit breaker uh, that we've modeled within the software. And you can see on the, on the right hand side, there's a ton of information that would usually come with us um, through spec sheets and as well as like different information that you would get. And the, this information helps you make decisions through the process as well. So we start from a small part and then build ourselves up, up into a bigger environment. So this is a thatch roof house that we built in a contextualized South African environment. And what we would either do is we would build a house like it would be built using sons and following regulation or we would go to an existing site, problems and all, and scan it, model it exactly the way it is, which allows students to go into this environment and then learn as if they were on site um, in a real site environment. So we like students to learn by doing. So be able to walk through virtual reality or through an edu gaming system, walk through these contextualized sites and then learn inside of these virtual environments. So what I want to show you is an example of a BIM model. So this, for example, is a, a DB board. And that circuit breaker that I, that I spoke about is actually inside of this DB board. And each part of this element, of, of this element has been individually modeled. And each part then has its information tied to it. So if I say show properties, you can actually see the brand name, um, what the amperage is, etc. There's also a link towards the, the site. So this is a Haga product. But the site, it would go to the site and you would see the cost and all of that. So we'll program each and every element, all the information you require to actually make an informed decision. So if we look at a bigger then from that DB board, that circuit breaker, that DB board, and then we go to the bigger context. This is a, a house that we then put this DB board in and built a PV system from that DB board all the way through. So it's just kind of showing how we build from small, growing all the way up, and that circuit breaker would even be able to be able to switch on and off you could take it apart for maintenance, and we can do this through all trades. So carpentry, bricklaying, plumbing, 
And then through this, on top of this, we build on top of this um, educational content as well as our, our systems. So here's another example. These are some examples of stuff we've used where a plumber would have to do a piece of an installation as their practical um, assessment. But now we can give them a contextualized environment where they can actually see how this would be installed in, in that, that context. So moving on to a little bit of the next step, which is virtual reality, our digital tools, and edu gaming. So we use, we use edu gaming as a tool where students can then play a game and gamify the learning experience. But this allows students to explore for themselves and learn by doing certain things in an environment which they wouldn't usually be able to learn in. Um, these, these tools also, we saw a gap where students aren't able to go to site and when they are appointed and they walk for the first time into site, they've never had an interaction with a client before. They've never been able to quote and they, this teaches them those critical thinking skills where they can then speak to the client and figure out the problem as the client is explaining to them and that problem then they can physically solve it by, by doing. Our digital tools are stuff like um, online, online video, um, online calendars. We have a learning management system, which I'll show you a little bit later. But this is, for example, we had online safety meetings. This was a lecture capacity training where we were training lecturers to use these new tools. Um, we also had the digital twin of the, the actual practical site that they were working on. And beforehand, we could do some planning, walk through, and actually do sessions where we showed them what we're planning on doing. So this as well, we have, we had, have a camera crew. There would be students actually doing physical installations on site with lecturers from all over Africa sitting in the session. And each of them, multidisciplinary, could give their input on how these students should approach the problem. Um, and then Aside from that, we also have someone in VR explaining how certain principles work. So all of this is running at the same time, and we can then give more of a contextualized experience and also allow certain lecturers from all around Africa to take part in this. This is an example of a practical assessment we've done where students will then do their practical assessment in plumbing, but now we've got these tools running side by side and they can have more of a contextualized view of how this would be installed in real life. Because a lot of times these installations are isolated to a certain part, but if you open that up, when they go to site, they understand why, how, where they're doing this. This is the learning management platform. So we're trying to move all of this content onto a cloud-based server where students can log in we can manage their login details. Lecturers can then use all of these tools inside one of these platforms. And students can go back and go through this content again, um, which helps immensely. Right, so this is some screenshots of the edu gaming version. Um, I would have loved to show you, but, but this is a perfect, perfect uh, view. So on, you can see that there on the right side, there is a quote where students actually quote the certain materials that they need for the, for the installation. And then they would go and speak to the client and the client would tell them what, what they need to be done. They would then walk through, do a quote, do planning. They've got the building plans. They've got all the measuring tools they need. And first of all, they, they measure and make planning for material, and then afterwards they do the physical installation. And as, for example, if they, they did not plan correctly, this would then factor that in and say, okay, cool, you had an unplanned trip to the store, you have to drive to the store, it would cost you 300 Rand to get there, and now your profit is going down. To kind of show how proper planning will make you more um, successful in the industry. I'm going to show you a video on our VR systems um, and how they, how they work. Just a real life example of one of our electricians actually practicing. So, oops. 
Give me one second. Okay, so I would just like to pause here, sorry. Um, this is Alan, <laughs> he works for Fosh. He's an electrician by trade, and he's gonna go through, the client asked him to do a, a two-way switch installation in that thatch house we saw in that um, environment. So you can see that he's lifting up his arm. He's got a plan of the building, a camera, and then also those three blocks that look like a Tetris block. That is to export what he's done to a practical environment so that after he's been through this contextualized environment, he can then do the physical installation in real life through his planning. So that would export it to a cubicle, and this cubicle be where he would do that physical physical installation. So as we run through, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this. So you can see he's using his, his joystick to move around and everything's modeled. So this is now an after. The client's already living here, but he wants a two-way switch installed on this wall. So now you can see that he, he makes the decision and he actually has to apply what he knows and the knowledge that he knows to actually do the job. Um, we, we have a multiplayer environment coming where lecturers can then be part of this, stand next to students and actually guide them through this process. I am not an electrician by trade, so I'm quite glad I'm not doing the VR <laughs> today for you guys. But you can see that he has done this a few times before and he knows what's going on. So now he's busy wiring up the two-way switch. And here you can see that he's actually selecting the cubicle wall that he would like to install this on afterwards. So this kind of ties the link between the two. What we're trying to do is fill the gap between the theory, which students usually read and do theory, but filling that gap to when you go to practical. So when he does practical, he's on site, it won't be an unfamiliar experience. So he's, he's already kind of practiced and, and knows what to expect in that environment. Cool. I'm going to go on. Right, so the future and what we are planning on doing. So I will show you a little bit of how these houses actually work in a bigger contextualized environment. But we're planning on implementing this on the metaverse. We've already had um, a trial run where we've had students meet each other with virtual avatars within this environment. And this means that you can have a small city, basically, with all of these buildings in a contextualized environment where students can then walk through. Lecturers can call students to a certain spot and say, listen, today we're going to go to a site. Um, this is the task that we have to achieve. And then all of these students can go with this lecturer, and the lecturer has all the tools available to him. So he's got whiteboard. He can pull students to a certain scenario, and they can all stand together. So this is collaboration to an extreme level where we are trying to make a digital classroom but in a real world site environment. Then also we're looking at doing 3D scanning um, and, and photogrammetry, which means we can go to a company or to a site, scan it in a 3D world, and then place that into our world. So any company that needs training for their, for their artisans on a certain level or with certain equipment, we can go then and scan that to what it would exactly look like, look like in real life. So just to quickly show you how far we are, this is our, our small city that I, that I spoke about. I'm just going to stand up here. So you can see here on the right side we've got apartment blocks and estate this is a big apartment building. This is a warehouse. This warehouse is fed through solar. There's the thatch house that we spoke about and that Alan was going through in VR. The little granny flat is sitting in someone's backyard. That is the edu gaming tools. So this allows you to then once again step up to an even bigger contextualized environment where students can then walk with lecturers down the street and actually look at services, bulk services that would be in the road. You could look at, we can even implement hotels, for example, where students can go in and train hospitality. So 
the, it's not only focused on the construction industry. We can then implement a lot of other industries in this environment. And like I said, it's to fill that gap going from theory to practical. I'm going to try and walk through and actually see if we can stand, just stand in this environment. I'm sorry, it's a little bit slow. Cool. Just to give you a little bit more of a feel of what is actually what is actually going on here. So this is the thatch house that we spoke about. And you would see, like I said, um, each and every part is modeled individually. So if we have a look, I'm going to walk forward a little bit. It's lagging a little. But if we have a look and I click inside of the wall and I hide this wall, you would actually be able to see conduits running um, you would see the light boxes, you would see the DB boards, there would be plumbing. And the other, the other advantages of this is having multiple disciplines actually working together. So, for example, when an electrician goes and he installs a light switch, or let's say he needs to drill a hole in the wall, being cognizant that there are already water pipes running through the wall, so those multiple disciplines actually come together with geysers, installations, all of those. Right. Cool. So that is a little bit of what we do. Um, we are trying to, like I said, fill the gap in the, in the industry. Um, and we're walking, working towards looking at the future of how we educate people in the industry. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you could please uh, just uh, join me here. Let me quickly get my phone before I forget. There we go. Because I did see a question. Um, maybe not for you, but uh, for someone else. In fact, let me start off with a poll, which is, do you use Google in your classroom? 44% of people said yes. 32% said no. And 24% of the people said, I would like to. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Tristan, thank you for your time. Thank you for a good presentation. Thank you. I think I've seen this technology being used, especially with like a lot of architectural companies, right? Mm. When, they, when they showcase houses or what it's going to look like and, and all those things. Mm. Am I correct? 100%, yes. I want to ask you, do you think this kind of technology would work in the country? In fact, if not the continent, because... We are not that IT acute. We don't have the infrastructure mm. as a continent, let alone as a country. Mm. So that's a good question. Actually, we've been looking at, we've been working with TVET colleges, and we've been looking at how we can implement these tools without actually having to build this large infrastructure. Mm. And the advantages these tools are that they can be loaded onto a computer any computer and you can run it off of that. So we've got two versions. We've got the VR and then that's why we have the edu gaming as well. The edu gaming means that you don't need to buy an expensive VR set. See. But we are, we are obviously making that available so that if a big company needs to train their employees, they can send them VR headset and they can actually experiment with this. Don't you think that, that this kind of uh, equipment or tool would, would work better, especially in conjunction with government departments as well, maybe to make know, th their systems more efficient? 100%, yeah. We, we, we were having a conversation the other day about how, let's say, the municipal, we want to put a municipal building inside of our, our space and having a client walk in and complain about a certain infrastructure not being up to standard mm. and someone at the at the government facility being able to walk them through and show them how these things work mm. so i agree with you 100 percent what is the future though and when you look at it what is the future of 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 this of the industry when when we talk about this where do you think we're going five ten years from now i'm very excited <laughs> uh, if we look at europe and at america for example I must say that, so that we are already ahead in Africa. 
which is incredible um, considering. Mm. And they are behind us at the moment. And what we can do is because we've got such a reliance on artisans in this country and we're trying to boost the artisan trade, these tools can definitely push forward. And using all of this, um, uh, for example, uh, let's look at the, the BIM that I spoke about. Mm. In Europe, they use it on a high level for corporate uh, environments. Mm. But a lot of those tools are so beneficial to where, where you could show artisans and teach them the soft skills that they need moving forward in the 4IR mm. and the digital revolution, basically. Mm. But don't you think that because we have issues of load shedding, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a, a, quite a huge challenge. I mean, currently we're sitting on stage four in some parts of the country. Yeah. It's three times a day. Don't you think that's also like a bit of a disadvantage, though? Well, yes, <laughs> but we walk, work through it. <laughs> Look, uh, we, we had this one uh, a project where we taught students how to build inverters, for example, electricians and welders mm -hmm. working together. And they were doing it in VR and they were doing this. So we're all conscious about the issues mm -hmm. that we have, but together as, as South Africans and Africans, mm -hmm. we solve these issues mm -hmm. and move forward. Yeah. Tristan White, thank you so much for your time. Um, looking forward to seeing you in the future and also seeing some of the products that you guys have to offer. For now, though, let's uh, please just enjoy this uh, upcoming video. We'll chat afterwards. As we celebrate our 70th anniversary in 2020, Sasol prides itself on being an international chemicals and energy company built on a foundation of intellectual and human capital. Harnessing this capital has enabled us to drive social investment as a catalyst for change, particularly in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. To further leverage these innate capabilities, in 2008, we established the Sasol and Zalo Foundation. The teaching and learning of maths and science is very challenging, particularly in historically disadvantaged communities. Sasol was responding to this challenge in order to help lift the standard of maths and science in the education system. In its first decade, the foundation invested 630 million rand in building a legacy to realize meaningful and long-lasting impacts in STEM education. Our approach, grounded in research and collaboration with various stakeholders and education experts, has led to the delivery of robust, well-designed and sustainable programs. Epitomizing this approach are the 180 STEM learner and educator workbook titles we produced that have reached over 10 million learners across three continents. What is significant about it is how a corporation can fundamentally make a contribution to the way education material and education resources is distributed, not only nationally, now internationally. It has also fundamentally impacted how uh, the Department of Education um, distributes material and reaches every single child in every single school that it has to reach with minimal effort. Since 2014, we have taken the world of science to far-flung schools in the most remote parts of the country through nine mobile science laboratories. So the mobile lab gives those students a chance to get into learning through touching and seeing and experimenting uh, in their communities and we believe in a small way, Sasol through mobile labs have contributed towards the real upliftment of the teaching and learning of maths and science. Recognizing that artisans are critical to building our economy, the foundation developed a network of five technical schools of excellence. We developed five technical schools, which we wanted to use them as model schools um, so that they can be replicated throughout the whole education system. Increasing access to quality education for performing yet disadvantaged students is a cornerstone of the Foundation's work, comprising not only monetary but also psychosocial support to deliver high study completion rates among students. The Foundation has awarded over 1,400 bursaries and fellowships in its first decade. In 2016, the Foundation began donating critical research equipment to support under-resourced institutions, helping to make them attractive and competitive. The foundation is investing in historically disadvantaged universities. We invest in uh, PhD students focusing on uh, research. Not only that, we also provide these universities with the capacity, the technology for these students to be able to make uh, their research. 
While the foundation reached the end of its first decade in 2018, its rich legacy lives on, renamed the Sasol Foundation. It now operates under an enhanced mandate, extending to the full education life cycle from early childhood education to work readiness, employment and entrepreneurship. We celebrate the 10 years of the Sasol Linzalo Foundation in, in this 70th year of Sasol's existence. It's part of the contributions Sasol make and has been making for seven decades of its existence. As the fourth industrial revolution drives change, enabled by extraordinary technological advances, the Foundation will ensure our programs continue to remain relevant for the future world of work, while remaining true to our purpose, delivering meaningful and long-lasting impacts in STEM education.